The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Short Time Wrestling Podcast moves on. We just finished the Cadet Freestyle Final. Saw some pretty exciting matches. Saw some uh, super studs in the making. Here with Freestyle Officials Coordinator Zach Errett. He's won the Golden Whistle from the artists formerly known as Fila. Uh, he has officiated the Olympic Games. Zach, what's up, man? Not much, Jason. Thanks for having me. So uh, we were talking on the way to Final X uh, about your. You have an interesting story about Fargo and uh, how this actually this town this event actually means more to you than, than a lot of other people. Well, it's certainly an event that I enjoy coming to, and, and been coming here for, I think, I was counting just a little bit ago. I think this is my 20th year. I think I started coming when I was 19. And some years ago, I think I can how exactly how old I was, but uh, most of my friends they all that I, that I spend time with decided to leave early. And so I was here for the duration of the event. So I end up uh, in that process going out with one of my other friends, and, and that's where I met my wife. She was a student here at North Dakota State, and, and long story short, I met her here. We had a long-distance relationship for a year, and then she moved to Indiana and married now with two kids. And it wasn't just North Dakota State. This, this, was, at, this was at Buffalo Wild Wings. It was. It was at Buffalo Wild Wings across the street. Uh, one of my really good friends and, and referee at the time, Stacy Davis, uh, who's currently coaching for Team Georgia, and my uh, and we were good friends, and we had spent a lot of time together. But when a couple of the other guys left, he's like, "Hey, you want to go to? We're going to go to Buffalo Wild Wings." And when we were there, we happened, you know, met, I ran in and met her and some of her other friends, and and it was the second to last night of the competition, so almost right at the end. And how long ago was that? So how many years has, have you guys been married for a while now? So I mean, how long has it been? Let me, let me think here. So, actually, I might be able to tell you: was the bar? And in the place where the garage door is now, is it like pre-renovation, way pre-renovation? I'm just, we've, it's gone through like four iterations since we've been here. It's it's pre-renovation. This was some this is some years ago. I've been married eleven years, and I met her three years before that. So I want to say it's about two thousand and two when I met when I met her. She was going into her senior year. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say two thousand and two, but it could have been two thousand and three. Not one hundred percent sure. I should probably know that since you know <laughs> been married for so long. Well, it's not a legitimate like anniversary anniversary it's like oh yeah it was that day you just know it is like the second to last day of fargo that's how we describe everything here what day is it what hey is it what is it monday no it's the third day that's how we describe it. what time is it monday so as as you've evolved as an official over the years your responsibilities have evolved uh before we even really get into that like explain the how the progression of officials go from rankings and how how a lot of people are really this is a but sometimes their first really big national tournament or, you know, or is it, you know, how do they go about refing this event and, and moving up the ladder? So when you sign up as a referee, you, you begin as an M3 and then you begin to go to competitions. Most t- people typically work within their state and not, and actually a majority of our membership for USWA actually doesn't make it to regional and national events. Um, the ones that want to get promoted end up going to regionals, uh, usually start with regional tournaments and they start progressing through and then go to some national tournaments. And, and every tournament you go to, you get up, you get evaluated. And then at the end of the year, we have a meeting and decide, you know, who based on the evaluations, who is eligible to be upgraded. And then so you upgrade. And so we begin as an M3, then you can move to an M2. Then there's a category called M1C, which is almost an M1, but maybe another year of working. And then eventually work up to become an M1, which is our highest category. So very similar to what they have for UWW as well. They go a 3-2-1 system as well. And so we've more or less adapted the similar part. And then once you become a Category 1, then you're eligible to actually apply for your UWW license. So you have to be our highest category within our country in order to potentially be an international referee. And you have to do it. The current rules for UWW have to be done before you become 40 years old. So, and, and in the past, we've had um, referees, uh, international referees from Old Fila, now current UWW, come over and look at other officials as looking for their upgrades and such. And we have foreign officials here in the past. Uh, Ibrahim from Turkey has come in. And, uh, you know, one, do they still come over for the same reason? And, uh, you know, how are the international officials? How do you guys look at the guys that really want those upgrades? How closely are you looking at them? So this, this is the only event that United World Wrestling allows to be able to 
work for uh, category maintenance, like this counts as an international tournament for referees, though it's a national tournament. So it's a very unique perspective, which is one that you know I know Rick Tucci had set up um, with the old leadership years before. So this has been ongoing for many, many years, and there was different um, levels at which they, you could be promoted. So right now, the last few, probably for the uh, now multiple years here in a row, this is a a competition where referees can come and actually get their international license and or they can be pr- promoted from a Category 3 to a Category 2. So for the number of years that we have an international referee that comes in to help do the evaluations, um, and this is far different than all other United World Wrestling tournaments and such of how it's operated. But, yeah, so we can we have international referees that can come in uh, to help to run the event and work the event, and they'll get evaluated too if they're here for promotion. So we've got three Canadian referees here. Uh, one is only just coming here just to work. The other two are coming for promotion, and we have one referee this year from El Salvador. Um, but largely this helps service a lot of our USA referees to be able to meet their category requirements of one international tournament a year uh, or and to work as an upgrade. I know I was upgraded from this event years ago as well so it's it's a it's a really good for us this is a great opportunity to be able to do that and be able to bring in individuals to to evaluate and uh, so i think it's a great it's it's really just a great option for us I, re- I remember when I used to do the broadcast for USA Wrestling, I'd sit over there where the broadcast perch was, and the Matt Chairman would be next to me. And that was one year Kari from Finland came over. And if, if you've been here to the tournament, you know he's the guy that always wore the blue and argyle, the giant blue argyle sweater. Uh, that was his look. And uh, so Jason Bobby from Colorado is sitting next to me. He goes, Twink, I'm looking for my upgrade, man. Don't dare, ma- don't you dare make me laugh. Don't you dare make me laugh. So, of course, I break in. That's like basically saying, hey, don't press the red button. Of course, I press the red button, you know, do, do a little spiel, throw a joke. And he's sitting there just trying not to, you know, just cracking up, trying not to basically laugh. Um, when you guys are up on the raised mat and, and you're going through this process or other referees going through this process, do you think there's a lot, a little more added pressure because you've got international eyes on you? You know, if you make one bad, is one bad call going to screw it up or is it got to be, is it how you manage a match more or less? So that's really, it's, a, it's an interesting question because many times even in international competitions, like you don't work that much at the United World Wrestling events. Like this is a unique event because there's only five or six referees. So you typically work a lot of matches over the course of time, which is one of the reasons why we really promote international referees to come here because it's such a great experience to be able to do that. There is added pressure when you walk up. It's the only elevated mat in the, in the, in the venue and you're walking up and you're getting evaluated on two matches you know, it comes down to basically performing well in those two matches. But honestly, that's much like what it is at international events. You're only going to work maybe two times an hour, and you're going to get evaluated during those matches. So, you know, if it goes well, you got a chance to be promoted if you have some problems and issues. And sometimes it's outside your control. It's just one of those circumstances that comes with it. So I think it's a really good avenue of how we do the, you know, evaluations here because there is some added pressure when you walk up on the platform for those those matches. So. You spent a long time as a high school coach in Indiana, and uh, after a brief hiatus, and you came back to coaching, helping out. When going from the folk style world, the high school world, to the freestyle world at such a high level, and there's you know there's a fan base here of college wrestling fans that will always say, well, freestyle is so subjective. The rules are so subjective. It's an exciting style of wrestling, exciting brand of wrestling right now, but that subjectivity can sometimes sour fans who are focusing on one match out of a thousand that look bad. And how do you try to counter that? How do you try to explain why freestyle is fun to watch? Or is it, you know, how hard is it to kind of combat that folk style first mentality when you you see some of the greatest athletes in the world, you know, wrestling for the highest position you can get in the sport, the Olympics and the world championships? Yeah, so when it comes to, like, the difficult situations and the calls, you know, a lot of times you typically try to, like, I know I do this sometimes with coaches. I'll be like, hey, take a look at this situation. What do you guys think right now? Especially when there's no, it's not one of their wrestlers. And it's really interesting because with freestyle, it's more based on criteria. Like you score points based on criteria. So you can really break things down into just a, a small number of categories. Like it's a standing action that goes directly to danger. And dangers an elbow, shoulder, a head past 90. So any action that happens, that's going to be four points. And so if you start looking at it from that perspective, then you're really evaluating actions based on that. And, and there are some situations that can certainly go one way or another based on where you're standing, what it looks like, because you're often looking at who's the attacking wrestler. And I think that's what's interesting about this sport. I think that makes it unique is the fact that it its goal is to protect the attacking wrestler. And so 
the more and it generates a lot more points. There's a lot more scrambles and scoring situations in the, in the matches. I've seen some matches here that were 18 to 17 just after the first period. And you're like, oh my gosh, they're scoring that many points. And it's just, and I think that's where it's gotten really exciting from that standpoint. Certainly there's some situations you're like, how did that get scored? You know, and there's certain things that you're looking for and there's certain things that we try to go through, but small changes in technique can really change how that gets evaluated. It's not so based on control where folks sell is. So trying to combat that, you know, I don't know if I try to combat it other than just try to like, here's how it's getting scored, here's what it is, know that sometimes depends on who's evaluated it it might go one way it might go the other way from a coaching standpoint certainly i think what's in what's what helps is you know we have i actually have six kids from a high school wrestling here wrestling uh, five in junior freestyle and one in uh, cadet freestyle and and the one thing you realize very quickly as you're wrestling this is how important it is to be able to finish on your feet and if you can finish shots in freestyle you can definitely finish them in folk style you know, because it's so much more difficult to finish in freestyle because there's so many more options for scoring points. And I think that makes it really such a unique style. And I would encourage many kids to give it a shot because if you can really make yourself a great freestyler, you're going to be a great folk styler. It's, it's inevitable. After uh, Neil Diamond and now ABBA, I'm not sure what they're doing over here with the music in the Fargo Dome. One of the more um, controversial moments of your career came around to match in 2016 in the Rio Olympics and uh, from a from a nerve standpoint I mean we all kind of saw the situations with you know one that there was the Mongolians and then there was the Franklin Gomez situation but when when you're when you're in the middle of a situation like that and one you weren't actually on the on the mat at that time you're part of the jury but nerves I mean pressure what goes through your mind when you uh, you know basically for lack of a better term the shit's going to hit the fan Sure. I, yeah, I think the one part that, especially at the Olympics, I think there's a lot more nerves and stress that comes with that because there's actually less wrestling there than at the World Championships because the athletes have to qualify. But what you're looking at now is every match means something. Like, if there's something on the line. And I think the part, too, that we don't always realize is an Olympic medal in some of these countries, that wrestler is now set for life. Like, in his country, like, he won't have to ever work again. Like, they're going to take care of him for the, forever. And so there's so much riding on that, and they've worked four years for that opportunity. And so there's certainly a lot of pressure with it. And then there's some, and there's certainly some situations that have occurred over time that, you know, at, those, at that event that have not been favorable for the sport. And when you're trying to go through that, it's, you're, I guess from my perspective, like, I'm, being fair is the most important part. Like, there's some times we're not going to necessarily. I'm not going to get the call right. I can, like, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to get every call right when I referee. I'm going to do my best, but I can tell you I'm going to be fair. And I think that's the part that I try to focus on, and I'm going to fight for when I'm there. Is regardless, there's not going to be a reason why I called it for one. It's other than that's what I thought the right call was. Is this kind of American ego to say that? I think our fans, even like Willie and in our, in our media, and, and we believe that our American officials are more fair. Uh, in international competitions than maybe some officials from other nations. Uh, do you think that there might be some credence to that, or is that just maybe our, our American perspective on things? Yeah, I think there's been a long history of that uh, in previous years, so I think it's it's rightfully it's it's been there. I think there's no doubt that over the years there's certainly been those situations where it's been 100% there's something going on. I think there's actually a culture changing and, and I'm fortunate to work with some really amazing referees who I think are very fair. And I think that a lot of times it's about finding those individuals. And I know that we found a lot of those. And I felt like, for the most part, last year's World Championships, there were, there, there were some, some situations that weren't, weren't as how we'd like them to be. And there are certain some things that I don't think looked very good. But I would say 99% of those matches – were done correctly. They 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 might have made a mistake here or there, but I didn't feel like there was any situation where they were making a call against somebody for a specific reason. And so, I can think of one. <laughs> so, and again, you're looking at 600, 700 matches over the course of the week, and if you've got one, 99 percent are, are still you know still doing well. And I think that you know where we run into is anytime we see a call that goes against somebody, we all the mentality at least has been. Well, they must be out to get us, and and sometimes that may have been the situation in pat the past, but 
I think that um, we're actually seeing a change in that. And I think I know that there's a lot of great referees, and I know there's some ones I think are very fair who've done a phenomenal job. And I think it's so important that you know we continue to work on changing that culture and that mindset. And I think that we're in the process of doing that right now. So the, the situation I'm going to bring up, and I, I don't really want to bring up specifics because you know, I mean, you weren't, but the situation with the with the Russian and the South Korean where. Time was out. The clock didn't start. Time was out. And, you know, Valiev ends up getting four two, four points and when he shouldn't have. And actually it ended up putting Rush in a position because he came back for a bronze. I mean, you look at those situations and you're like, that's correctable. How does something like that not get corrected? So, I, and I agree. That, that match was, was the one match that I felt like, you know, we had had a really good, up to that point, it had been going really well, like there had been. And I think even after that match, things went really well. And as I and as I told some other people, like that one match, it's like you take one step forward and then you have a situation and you feel like you take two steps back. And the part I try to focus on, like certainly that was something that happened that probably was correctable. And we've certainly had situations similar to that here. You know, all of a sudden you go back and look, you know, the clock didn't run or something. You go back and, and check and, you know, well, like, is there some? Is it something in the rulebook that you cannot put time back on the clock because the situation's clock didn't start? Well, just you know, or it ran. So they forgot to stop it, and ten seconds rolled off. I mean, I've never seen them put clock time back on the clock internationally. Yeah, I, we were actually talking to somebody about when they do potentially put time back on the clock, and there's only a couple situations and when that happens, um, and it's usually after challenge, just like a slip that was down, they didn't call it, and then they decide it was a slip. They'll go back, take away any points, and then put the time back on the clock. Um, but many times there's not really anything clearly defined in the rule book that says you go back, you watch this, this is, here's how you do. And that's what they were trying to work on to get something in the rule book with that, you know. But does something need to be in the rule book or is that just what should be done? You know, I know we do that here. We'll look and say, okay, how much time was on there? All right, let's go back and see. And so, you know, that was certainly one that wasn't good for the sport. You know, we're looking for what's best for the sport because, I mean, I know people that are listening to this, this ca- uh, podcast are going to, they're, they're they're wrestling fans. They want wrestling to stay in the Olympics. They want this to continue, and things like those situations don't don't help the sport. And I think that's the one thing you know we're trying to work toward. And I feel like again, outside of that one match, I would say that a majority of the matches went really well. And I can't I can't think of there's some situation where maybe this was four, or maybe this was two, but it was a judgment situation call. But and, I'm, and now I try to focus on what did we what what went well, you know, because we did a lot of things well, and the referees that were there did a lot of things well. That mistake actually came outside of the the main refereeing body, you know, so that we're doing the matches match in and match out. So dialing back to Rio, and this is something that's changed because you were assigning the officials in the World Championships in 2015, and what goes into the assignments, and then you know, there's there's Rio that came out, and they were not random. Now there's been a system installed that those officiating assignments are more randomized. Of course, there's some things you throw in together. Of course, international politics come into play. You can't put an Israeli ref on an Iranian, that type of thing, or, or, or on a women's match or a woman on an uh, Iranian. It's something like that. You know, those, those are taken into consideration. But explain the, the steps that went to, one, it wasn't random. It never was random because you assigned them personally in 15. Explain that process and how we got to where we're at now technologically and how that's been received. So in 2015, largely what happens is you have this long list of referees and the matches are coming up and you're you're looking at the matches, you're looking at which countries are involved, which countries may be related to other countries um, or might have connections to them. And so you try to avoid putting those people in those positions hypothetically, not just like the former Soviet republics, but like Armenia and Azerbaijan have a, a very well-publicized, not a civil war because they share a, like a border war. So you typically want to keep the Armenians away from the Azerbaijans typically, right? Correct. There's a lot of factors you look into and you start looking at the assignment. So you're factoring a lot of those things. And sometimes those are just political things too, like what's going on in the world at that current time with countries besides Azerbaijan and Armenia. But sometimes you have other conflicts and you're like, yeah, it's probably not good to put those countries together for this sake. So you're looking at those situations and you're also trying to make sure that you're dividing the work up as well, you know, because you don't want to come to the world championships and then one referee works 25 times and one person works once, you know. So you're trying to also keep track of how many times they're working. So it was very an extensive process. Like literally it was a full-time job. Like that's what I did the last four days in Las Vegas. 
And then after Rio, there became a need for some sort of randomization of how can we get the referees to where it's being selected off of a computer pro program set up to be able to do that. So now you can go in and pretty much eliminate with a, each referee kind of has a, I would say a profile. I wouldn't say a profile, but like it's on a spreadsheet. And you can indicate the countries that you want them to be away from. So, for example, a lot of times like USA won't work Canada matches. Like we're too close in connection. That's It's just not good to have that close of so that will be often on there as well so anytime that comes up that the system takes into account that these are countries that this person shouldn't work and will take them out of the mix when you assign it it also you keep track of only certain people are going to work as matt chairman so you select that group and then you essentially hit the button and it assigns the referees and it keeps track of making sure that you're equal number of times working based on that it also is supposed to factor in the consulate the repechage matches that if the wrestler that made it to the finals, you know, you're, you're, if, you, if your country lost to that wrestler, like let's say Korea versus Japan, Korean, the Korea wrestler wins, they'll try to keep the Japan wrestler referee from refereeing the Korean at any time during that process because they know that if the Korean gets there, the Japanese wrestler will get back in. So the system also factors that in as well. And there's just a lot of things that goes into play. And sometimes you have to make corrections because sometimes because the way it's set up, it will it could literally assign the same person three times in a row because they're the best option for that. But you can't really work the same person three times in a row on the mat. So you have to make some you know, adjustments with it. But either way, it's you know the system's really good. It certainly helps to be able to give it more randomness, you know, and it kind of takes that out of, one person being able to really manipulate the assignments which up until after before Rio that's just the way it was at every competition you went to like the one person or would make the assignments so Repishox funny you bring that up because I remember a situation with you in Russia in Moscow in 2010 and Mango loses to uh, one, the, the Russian wrestler I can't remember his name off the top of my head and you've got the whistle on the Russian the next match and he gets upset and some of our Americans like our American official just eliminated Spencer Mango. How do you, I mean, you didn't do it because the wrestlers, you know, they wrestled. I mean, I think it was a penalty point or a caution or something that did it. It was, it was something that was like, well, that stinks. How do you how do you deal with that? I mean, do you get approached about that or, or is that just something that somebody might be mad at the moment? You just got to let it roll off your back. Well, in that situation, I mean, you have to consider that they just made a huge point in a meeting that if you crawl on parterre, that it was fleeing the hole and you're going to call caution at one point. So, honestly, Jason, if I don't make that call, we're probably not having this conversation right now because I probably wouldn't have – I probably would have gotten downgraded and go from there. So when they say this is the call you need to make, okay, that's the call we're going to make. You know, And for me, like, I guess the other thing, too, with with from our perspective, like, I think, like, we're fa- – I think we're fair referees. I think whoever – any of the U.S. referees are always going to be fair you know, in that situation, they're just going to call what you think. And I'll be, honestly, my thought process often doesn't come into like, what call do I need to make that's going to help somebody else out? Like, that's just not how I think we're. Our, it shouldn't be how you think. Our culture's ingrained that way. And so, like, and a lot of times it's difficult to like think about those situations when you're out there in the moment because it's happening so quickly. Like, if I start thinking about what I'm going to call, like, I'm probably not going to get them right. Like, you just, whatever you see, you score right now or you make that call right now because you don't have time to, like, process it in your head because it has to happen really quickly. Because I know, and we had this comment, I actually talked in the meeting this morning about this. The more we start thinking about what it is, sometimes they come up with crazy calls. And you're like, where did that call come from? Well, they start overthinking the situation. And I'm like, whatever you see, the first thing you see in a scoring action, score it you're probably going to be right more times than not. The more time you start trying to really process and analyze it many times, you'll end up confusing what it was. So you don't have time to think about it, and that's kind of where, in that situation, that was certainly one that I didn't, you know, it just it came, we made the call, and literally, I can't tell you, maybe five matches before that, the guy in charge came down and told everybody at our table, hey, if they crawl in parterre, you have to do this. So I made it. Okay, the Village people have now come on here in the Dome, and they, they've reconfigured the head table here this year, and there is an entire table of pairers across the Dome dancing to the Village people and doing YMCA. What is this world coming to? This song is 38 years old. I know because it was number one when I was born in 1979. So 
We are coming full circle here in Fargo. Zach Eric, anything else you want to add that maybe will be helpful to wrestling fans when they're watching Freestyle Wrestling? They may be new to it or they, they, they might see a nuanced rule, whether it's the, the momentum carrying a guy in four to a two and things like that that, you know, will help them understand the sport and appreciate it a little bit more from, a, from an official's viewpoint and go, okay, that wasn't a hose job. That's how the rule is written. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of getting out and watching the videos and seeing how things get scored. We certainly got, we have some videos on the USWA website that go through the basics of freestyle wrestling and Greco-Roman, and you can watch the videos. It kind of goes through, here's what how the scoring situations go and what we're looking for. And, and as you watch those, that's kind of that part to look for. I know we're currently, with United World Wrestling, they developed uh, some, I remember last year in Paris, they had some videos they would play up that kind of went through some basics of the rules and point scoring just to show for the casual fan that was in the place. And so we're working on those again this year with newer videos and trying to do that. But anytime you can get a chance to watch those and kind of piece that together, it's even better. And then, you know, one thing I'd encourage is if you really you want to learn more about it, give it re- referee and give it a shot. You'll learn it really quickly as you go through and you're like, oh, yeah, that's what that is and that's what we're looking for in that process. And I know I can tell you that I feel like I'm a much better coach because I referee because it gives me a new perspective on the rules and how I can use the rules to my benefit if I know the rules really well. Like, what should I do in certain situations? I can tell our kids here when we were wrestling, I said, if you're up two points with 20 seconds to go, or 15 seconds to go, I said, don't fight a situation. If you feel like you're getting taken down, run out of bounds. Take the caution of one point. I can give two caution of one points and still win two to two because I've got criteria. So if I know the rules really well, you can use those rules to help you be a better coach. So I'd recommend trying to you know, learn them and watch video and see how you can do it. So, Yeah, not saying that that should be a strategy, but situational awareness is always a good thing. So, Zach, appreciate the time and the, and the education. If they are interested in saying, okay, yeah, I mean, obviously you go through your state association, but they want to learn more about it, what are some resources out there that fans can go on the web and check out? So... Uh, one area you go to is certainly is uh, www.usa.com, US, USWOA.com. That's where that's the official's website. There's a rule book. There's also called The Art of Refereeing. Tim Pearson put together a document that's exceptional talking about the mechanics of with refereeing and how that goes. But we've got rules on there as well. We got we basically had took the UWW rule book and consolidated it into uh, four or five pages. And many of the video, many of the, the rules have a video link beside it. So you can read the rule and then watch a video. Now the videos are a little dated, but you can watch the video and it, and it shows you that situation. So I think it's, that's a really good place. And also you can go to the USWA uh, Facebook page. And now we just ended this year right when we get to Fargo, but every February we put a video of the week or video of the day and it goes through a video and says, how would you score it from this pr- perspective? And then every day there's a new video. Tim Pearson does an amazing job, like, getting those videos up. And it's just a, just a way to work on here's what you see, here's what people think the, the score is, and just get some good dialogue going about what people are looking for. So, Yeah, I've, I've seen those videos shared in various wrestling groups on Facebook, like the Wrestling Insider. Shout-out to Mike Houston. Who, and we always get into some discussions there. And people are like, well, it was like, it's like this. And then, you know, well, it's not in the rule book. I'm like, well, you know, countering in the zone, for example, stuff like that. But, uh that's another topic, another time. So, Zach, appreciate the time and, and, and the educational resources uh, and, and, and the, uh, I guess, the sentimental value of, of the Fargo Dome and the B-dubs. Yes, yes. Thanks, Chase. I appreciate it. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Clothing. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. First time listening? Well, you can change that by going to matttalkonline.com slash get short time to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or listen on your favorite podcatcher at matttalkonline.com slash listen. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.